My name is Brian Birch. Uh, I have the pleasure of working with uh, Kelly and other colleagues across campus on religious studies related courses and programming and it's our pleasure to host you here for this for this event. So and again a hearty welcome to all the presenters who uh, t have taken the time to come in and share their ideas with our students. Uh, I'm also very excited to introduce uh, Kelly, who, as many of you know, has been a longtime friend and collaborator and colleague of mine uh, in the Department of Philosophy and Humanities. And she has done remarkable work in areas related specifically to the way in which the Mormon tradition intersects with uh, philosophy and theology. Her contributions have been enormous uh, publishing articles in liberation theology, uh, religious diversity, uh, and a variety of other right, theologically important issues uh, that have really taken the conversation within the, the Mormon community forward in terms of right, serious theoretical uh, thinking. And uh, I've learned a tremendous amount from her over the years, uh, and it's been a delight to work with her. And I want to congratulate her on, on organizing this conference and for all the other work that she does. So please join me in welcoming Kelly Potter. Thank you, Brian. And thank you for the money for this conference. <laughs> so a little bit of context here. So um, this conference, the... Um, the, st the stimulant for this conference was uh, a book that was uh, published by Rutledge recently uh, called The Lost Sheep in the Philosophy of Religion, which looks at sort of underrepresented perspe under perspectives and issues in the philosophy of religion. Um, in that book, uh, I published a paper called A Transfeminist Critique of Mormon Theologies of Gender, in which I argued that the dominant orthodox interpretation of um, Morm the Mormons the Mormonism's theology of gender um, wasn't a necessary way to go. It wasn't, there was nothing about the tradition that required that you go that direction. Um, and, and I also argued that even the Mormon, uh, sorry, the Mormon feminist uh, it, uh, approach to theologies of gender um, was similarly, they didn't have to go in that direction. In other words, what I was trying to show with that work is that, is that there's a contingency in how we interpret, or maybe even like an element of convention, in how we interpret religious traditions. And I offered an alternative interpretation of what Mormon theology of gender could look like that would be trans-friendly. Um, as somebody who's trans, that's something that concerns me, obviously. As somebody who was raised Mormon in a church that doesn't accept trans folk, that of course obviously concerns me. So that's that's where I'm coming from. Um, and this paper that I'm going to read is a spin-off of of that work. Um, so I'm dealing with a problem that I mentioned in that other paper that I didn't really get into. So. The title of this paper is Mormon Materialism, Feminism, and Gender. It was going to be radical feminism, but I'm not going to talk about radical feminism, just feminism now. <laughs> the theological resources of Mormonism include a robust and non-reductionistic materialism, as well as a commitment to a female god. That is, or sorry, the being that Mormons call Heavenly Mother. Given that a number of feminist philosophers of religion have emphasized the need for, one, a more robust exploration of embodiment, and two, reconceiving of the divine as feminine, one might think that, that Mormon theology could be a basis for a feminist approach in the mainstream of Mormon thought. In fact, a lot of Mormon feminists have thought that. But with, with some few exceptions, this has not actually been the case. In fact, Mormon writers have, have attempted to make use of its materialism and belief in Heavenly Mother Mormon writers that have, sorry, attempted to make use of its materialism and belief in Heavenly Mother to articulate feminist interpretations of Mormon theology have usually found themselves sanctioned and even excommunicated by the church. 
Moreover, it is clear that the leadership of the LDS Church has taken, uh, I think fair to say, anti-feminist stance on the role of women in church and society. I, I do realize that the church just put out a statement about feminism. Um, I want to think about this contradiction between the LDS Church's sexism and their theological similarities with one strand of um, this feminist philosophy of religion. As I mentioned, a well-known feminist criticism of traditional Christian theism is based on the fact that the latter pits embodied reason, or sorry, embodied passion and desire against disembodied and dispassionate rationality, and then equates femininity with embodiment and masculinity with disembodiment. By contrast, feminist philosophers of religion, such as Pamela Sue Anderson, in, in her book, uh, A Feminist Philosophy of Religion, argue for an approach to understanding divinity that embraces the feminine divine, embodiment, desire, and importantly, sexual difference. Anderson writes, I would argue, given that to be human is to be embodied, that knowledge which is human must be knowledge as embodied. If being rational is said to be sep being separated from the body, then achieving rational human knowledge would seem to be logically impossible. Since human knowledge necessarily involves embodiment, it could be that the difficulty with rational human knowledge lies in the definition of rational. Why should being rational mean being separate from the body? Modern philosoph this is still quoting, modern philosophical theists assume that what needs to be assume what needs to be proved, that truth has its ultimate ground in both the ungrounded idealization of God as supremely good, purely rational, bodiless, and omnipotent. The result of such assuming, uh, uh, the re result of assuming such idealizations is the ramified beliefs of theism, including the various pernicious beliefs which devalue women's bodies as mothers, lovers, and sexual partners. Such contradictions and mystifications of human reason are precisely the objects in need of feminist critique." End quote. It is clear that feminists such as Anderson are right to claim that traditional Christianity, at least traditional Christian philosophy, has for the most part accepted a fundamental dichotomy between body and soul or mind, and that this dichotomy is a hierarchy, is a hierarchy with the body having a lesser valence than the soul. And of course, God is not embodied on the traditional view except in the person of Jesus. Moreover, rationally, or sorry, rationality is associated with the spiritual, while passion is associated with embodiment. Therefore, God does not and could not have body parts or passions. Like Anderson, Orthodox Mormon theology questions this traditional theistic picture. According to Mormonism, there's no fundamental ontological distinction between body and spirit. Joseph Smith says that all spirit is matter, but it is more fine or more pure. Moreover, God the Father, that is, Heavenly Father, is embodied and was once a man like us. In the famous King Follett Discourse, Joseph Smith writes, God himself who sits enthroned in yonder, yonder heavens is a man like unto one of yourselves. If you were to see him today, you would see him in all the person, image, fashion, and very form of a man like yourselves. For Adam was a man formed in his likeness and created in the very fashion and image of God. He was once a man like one of us. And he referring to God. He was once a man like one of us and that God himself, the father of us all, once dwelled on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did in the flesh and like us. Moreover, that end quote, moreover, it would seem that divinity is compatible with passion, since as Smith says, that which is out without body parts and passions is nothing. There's no other God in heaven but that God who has flesh and bones. Given that the Father has a body and humans are to become like him, Smith taught that the 
that the body was an essential element in their eternal progression towards ex what they call exaltation, which is essentially salvation. Clearly, the body plays a positive role in Smith's um, theology. And, and Mormon materialism doesn't st stop there. In addition to having a seemingly positive approach to the body, Mormonism embraces the idea that the spirit is itself material. In the Doctrine and Covenants, we, we, uh, Joseph Smith writes, there is no such thing as immaterial matter. All spirit is matter, but it is more fine or pure. This means that there, end quote, this means that there is no fundamental divide between the spirit world and the world of ordinary coarse bodies. It is also important to point out that Mormonism's materialism differs from the materialism that was common in the philosophical world in the 19th century. The latter, de the latter was deterministic, where matter was understood to be dumb and moved only by the laws of mechanics. By contrast, Mormonism is committed to free will and an open future. And at least one 19th century Mormon theologian, Orson Pratt, even argues for a panpsychistic view of the nature of matter. In other words, everything has consciousness. Not only does Mormonism reject mechanistic materialism, but it also avoids materialist reductionism. Indeed, Pratt, mentioned above, thought that consciousness is not unique to human and humans and animals, but instead a feature of every fundamental particle in the material world. Subjectivity is also important in Mormonism in the, in the more practical sense that it is at the center of Mormonism's epistemology. In Mormon epistemology, the faithful can have emotionally charged experiences that constitute a basis for their knowledge of the doctrines and practices of the church. In fact, every member is expected to have these kinds of experiences in order to make decisions about their personal lives, unless that decision is to be trans. Sorry. Despite the fact that the materialist direction of Mormon theology might seem like a basis for progressive theology in practice, according to the feminist argument mentioned above, Mormon orthodoxy advocates a rather conservative practice regarding the body, sex, and gender. Some church leaders take a cue from Paul comparing the body to a temple. In the LDS church, the temple is a sacred place and must be kept clean, both physically and spiritually. Non-members and unworthy members, I've been both of those, are not allowed to enter the temple since their presence could defile the building. So if the body is like a temple of the Lord, then it should be kept clean as well, both literally and morally. Some of the things that are seen as defiling the body are drugs, alcohol, coffee, tea, homosexual sex, or sorry, heterosexual sex outside of marriage, homosexual sex, masturbation, pornography, immodest dress, and of course, elective transsexual operations. That's what they call it. Some things are, are sometimes discouraged, such as tattoos, multiple piercings, long hair on men, and sodas with caffeine. The late church leader, Elder Boy K. Packer, says about tattoos, for example, that, quote, you would not paint a temple with dark, pi dark pictures or symbols or graffiti or even initials. I've been watching Sabrina, and I think I question that. It depends on what kind of temple you're talking about. As I mentioned above, Mormonism's materialism is intertwined with its understanding of the nature of gender. The official LDS church document, The Family, A Proclamation to the World, hereafter I'll just call that the proclamation, gender is seen as an essential characteristic of each individual in their pre-mortal, mortal, and post-mortal existence. This makes sense in the context of a materialist approach to the pre-mortal spirit. As mentioned above, spirit is asserted to be matter that is more fine or pure. Additionally, Mormon, uh, Mormons understand the spirit to have a similar appearance and structure to the coarse bodies that they inhabit, like in the film Ghost with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore. The proclamation takes this materialist correlation between body and spirit further by asserting that the spirit is sexed. So according to the orthodox LDS view, our spirit bodies are like reflections of our earthly bodies, and this includes a spiritual reflection of our biological sex. This is seen as fixed throughout one's pre-mortal, mortal, and post-mortal existence. Mormons have a pre-mortal life. To be sure, 
This view is weird <laughs> and possibly even incoherent, but it serves to ground the LDS Church's cishet patriarchy. So what about the, the more progressive interpretations of Mormon theology on the body and the feminine divine? In the 1990s, Mormon feminists also took a binary and quite essentialist approach to gender. For example, in their groundbreaking book, Strangers in Paradox, Explorations in Mormon Theology, Margaret Toscano and Paul Toscano write, a theology of, of a god of flesh and glory provides a model preserving binary opposites, but refusing to favor one component over the other or to link the so-called less favorable component with the female. If God is both body and spirit, then we may, we may believe that both are equally necessary and valuable. For us, God is not only flesh and glory, but also male and female. We disagree with those who assert that avoiding sexism means picturing God as being beyond gender and sexuality. A picture of God beyond all categories and relations encourages the very spirit-matter dichotomy which has denigrated women and sex. In our view, the, the more salutary doctrine is one that sees God as spirit and body male and female. For this reason, we have come to accept both a male God and a female God, each of whom is simultaneously transcendent and imminent." End quote. It's not clear whether this approach that the Toscanos take rules out the possibility of binary trans folk, but it certainly rules out the possibility of non-binary and gender fluid individuals or people that are agender without gender. And it is obviously an essentialist approach to gender. Both of the Tos Toscanos were eventually excommunicated for their views about God the Mother and the role of women in the church. I should also mention in this context that Margaret Toscano has changed her views about the binary nature of sex and gender. She's now committed to the idea that sex and gender is a spectrum and it's dynamic. Her work there hasn't been published yet. Mormonism's extreme anthropomorphism, arising from its materialism, raises interesting questions about the nature of the divine body and how it relates to human bodies. In addition to worries about God's skin color, for example, Mormonism raises questions about whether God's body is sexed. Does God the Father have a penis and God the Mother a vagina? Blasphemous though this question might be, it, it's legitimate, logically. Of course, if some kind of spiritual procreation is indeed the manner in which deities produce spirit children in the pre-mortal life, then perhaps gods, the gods do have genitalia. Taken in this direction, Mormon theology starts to sound more like Greek religion than it does like Christianity. And we can put the, push this sexiness even further to the next level, given that pre-mortal spirits are supposed to have gender as well. Do spirits have spir spiritual penises and vaginas? Although we saw that the LDS Church takes a rather, rather negative approach to the praxis of the body, I believe Mormonism has resources for emphasizing the positive potential in bodies. There are hints concerning how LDS theology could have taken a different direction in James Faulkner, the BYU professor, James Faulkner's essay, Divine Embodiment and Transcendence, Propodeutic Thoughts and Questions. In this article, Faulkner argues that Mormonism's material, materialist theology requires a rejection of both substance dualism and reductive materialism. The problem is that reductive materialism misses something essential about the nature of the embodied experience. He states, quote, we can speak of a body, animate or inanimate, in terms of its characteristics, in other words, scientifically, or we can speak of it in terms of its situatedness, interactions, activities, relations, what I will call shortly openness. However, to see a body in terms of only, uh, in, in terms only of characteristics is tantamount to seeing it as a corpse. Even if the characteristics discussed are characteristics peculiar to a living being, to see the body only in terms of physical characteristics is to see it only in terms of the effects it produces as a material entity, its uses, its, its goals. It's not to see it in 
in terms of a life. And so it is to miss crucial aspects of what it means to be embodied, end quote. Faulkner further argues that this openness of the body is what accounts for human and divine transcendence. He states, as I see it, there are several things we can say about human transcendence, all of them implicitly matters of embodiment. And so all of them candidates for helping us think about what divine embodiment means. A first is that humans are, qua humans, transcendent. A second is that for human beings, transcendence means openness and exposure. It means the possibility of suffering, end quote. The concept of openness is crucial for understanding divine and human embodiment. On Faulkner's interpretation of Mormonism's materialism, so let's explore it a bit further. Openness is a characteristic of bodies that involves situatedness, activity, and relationships. Situatedness involves the fact that bodies are always already in the world, that is, in an environment. Given that the human is essentially embodied, the human is not separate from the world, even in principle. Being in the world is part of what makes us what we are, and so we are essentially relational beings. Activity implies dynam dynamism. And the body is not a static entity with a timeless essence. Seeing bodies as active, relational, and situated seems to imply a rejection of substance metaphysics. That is what Faulkner calls ontotheology. I think that's uh, Heidegger. But Our being is tied up with the being of others. Faulkner importantly notes that this openness that he ascribes to the lived body raises the possibility of suffering. Although Faulkner doesn't say anything about how his approach to Mormonism's theology of embodiment relates to the issues of taking care of the body, including issues about bodily modification, I want to suggest that it could be the basis of a quite positive approach to the praxis of the body. The idea that the body is fundamentally dynamic is friendly to the idea that sexual features could themselves change. Moreover, the idea that the body always involves the possibility of suffering coheres with the view that the suffering involved in gender dysphoria, for example, which is the state that some trans people have of feeling discomfort at their assigned gender and or the, 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 sec uh, the sexual characteristics of their body. Uh, I'll read that again. The idea that the body always involves the possibility of suffering coheres with the view that the that the suffering involved in gender dysphoria is natural rather than a result of caving into sin sinful temptation. Finally, Faulkner's idea that the body must be considered as something with a life that includes irreducible subjective states seems to indicate that we cannot under tra understand trans bodies unless we understand the lived trans experience. Dovetailing with the Mormon idea that each member of the church can receive revelation from God concerning personal issues, it would seem that we must, we must trust trans folk when they testify about their experience of their gender and their dysphoria. This is the only approach that respects trans folk as bodies with lives rather than bodies that are treated as mere objects, that is, as if they are corpses. Given the openness of human bodies, it seems natural to apply this openness to the nature of the sexed body and gender. The sex body as we encounter it in scientific discourse, is, is not what we think it is in everyday discourse. In the latter, sex is male and female, exhaustively and exclusively. But biologically, the body itself defies this classical binary, as is obvious with the case of intersex individuals. The LDS Church has no official position on intersexuality, but the existence of intersex individuals does seem to raise a significant problem for its binary approach to gender. Furthermore, they are often the victims of intersection, intersex individuals are often the victims of non-consensual but elective elective genital surgeries, which sometimes 
don't conform to their subjective sense of their gender and cause dysphoria. In fact, in 10% of the cases. These cases disrupt our everyday gender framework. Material reality exceeds or transcends our conceptualization of it. Our conceptualization of sex and gender must allow for this disruption and hence must remain open-ended. And it is hard to see how an approach that accounts for intersex individuals assigned to the wrong gender by ignorant doctors wouldn't also allow for the possibility of trans individuals. The fates of transgender and intersex uh, believers are tied together in their resistance to the gender binary in Mormonism. So we can see that a coherent and trans-friendly interpretation of, of Mormon theology it emerges out of this. Faulkner's approach to the body allows for sexual features to change over time and furthermore allows for the importance of suffering to the nature of the body. On the emerging view, gender is dynamic even if it remains part of who we are. So what is the upshot here? We discussed the fact that Mormonism is committed to a kind of non-reductive materialism and also questions some of the binaries in traditional Christianity. The binary between rationality and passion is definitely questioned in Mormon theology, for example. Although this critique seems radical in the context of traditional philosophical theism, it is not put to radical or even progressive purposes in Mormonism. Official LDS theology and practices are still deeply sexist and deeply anti-LGBTQ. Moreover, the anthropomorphism that is intertwined with Mormon materialism encourages a kind of difference feminism that runs the risk of being trans-exclusionary. But things are not quite as bleak as all that, since I have showed, shown that there's another way to interpret Mormon, uh, Mormonism's materialism that is friendly to trans folk based on the fact that Mormonism's understanding of embodiment is non-reductive and dynamic. So what does this all mean for the feminist approach in the philosophy of religion that emphasizes embodiment and the feminine divine? I think that it puts pressure on their methodology in two ways. First, Anderson's approach assumes that there is a rather definite content in religious belief. That is, it assumes cognitivism, or sometimes called realism. And, and this is the view that's customary in a lot of discussion in contemporary philosophy of religion, or analytic philosophy of religion at least. However, this case study of how Mormonism deals with the body and gender reveals that there really isn't definite content in Mormon theology, per se. Unless you start with the question-begging assumption that the orthodox interpretation is correct, and the heterodox ones are wrong, which would, of course, uh, uh, make you, have you agreeing with past church leaders who are racist. What are the implications of the commitment to materialism and the feminine divine then? It's, it's not clear. I believe that this is true of many, if not all, religious beliefs. The nature of religious belief is such that it's always indeterminate, and this indeterminacy allows dominant groups to interpret the tradition in ways that justifies their domination over others. The values of the dominant group determine how they interpret the faith and not the other way around. We see this in the case of Mormonism given that its materialism can be interpreted in a rather conservative way despite its commitment to embodiment as, an impo as a positive thing and its affirmation of God the Mother. It is no accident that men are the only ones involved in deciding on this conservative interpretation and it's not just, it's older white men, mostly white men. Second, Anderson's approach isn't sufficiently attentive to the context of the social structures that inform those interpretations. Perhaps in the context of a denomination that adheres to a very traditional form of, Christ of Christian theology, emphasizing the body and the feminine divine can have a liberating effect. But in a Mormon context, the same idea ends up reinforcing an extreme patriarchy cishet patriarchy. Critiques such as Anderson's then are very contextually sensitive 
and perhaps even more so than Anderson would admit. At risk of putting this too tritely, I want to say that feminist philosophy of religion is too idealist in the Marxist sense in how it approaches the critique of religious belief. On their view, religious practice follows from religious belief. First you believe, that tells you what to do, so then you practice, right? The feminist critic helps the faithful to change their interpretation of their faith in order to facilitate the liberation of women, oppressed minorities, and queer folk. But it doesn't look like this will work. We have to look at the material circumstances of the religious institution or community. That is, what we need is a, a, a materialist analysis of religion in the Marxist sense. We need to start with religious practice rather than religious belief because the practices will determine how we're going to understand the beliefs. Thank you.